Well, if you'll take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to 2 Thessalonians, we'll be in chapter 2 this morning, verses 1 through 3. And as you're turning there, I want you to consider the mission statement of a very well-known university. This is the mission statement, to be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of your life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ. This university was founded in 1636, and at that time it employed exclusively Christian professors. You had to be a professing Orthodox believer in order to be employed there. And they emphasized character formation in their students above all else. And they placed a strong emphasis on equipping ministers to share the good news. Every diploma that this university gave out to students who graduated had the Latin words Christo et Ecclesiae around the Latin word veritas, and that meant truth for Christ and the church. You've probably heard of this school. It's Harvard. Harvard University. But only 80 years after its founding in 1636, a group of New England pastors sensed that Harvard had drifted too far from its original founding principles. And they were concerned by the secularization at Harvard, and so they approached a wealthy philanthropist whose name was Elihu Yale to plant a new university. And so in 1718, they called the college Yale University. And Yale's motto was not just veritas, which is truth, but it was lux et veritas, light and truth. Today, Harvard and Yale's legacy of academic excellence are unparalleled. They are two of the top universities in the world, but neither school resembles anything of what their founders intended them to be. At the 350th anniversary celebration at Harvard just a few years ago, uh, Stephen Muller, who had been the former president at Johns Hopkins University, said, the bad news is the university has become godless. Larry Summers, who had been a former president at Harvard, he confessed, things divine have been central neither to my professional nor to my personal life. Harvard and Yale's founders were unmistakably clear in their goals. It was Christian formation and academic excellence, but they drifted from that. In the world today, that might be called mission creep. You've probably heard that terminology used. The same thing, unfortunately, has happened in the church far too often. A lot of churches have lost their focus as well, and they've, they've lost sight of what they were founded to do and what they were founded to be, and they were, they've, they've abandoned the, the foundational truth on which they are. Now, we may call that mission creep in the world, but the Bible has another name for it, apostasy, apostasy. And while apostasy in a secular institution may cause us to shake our heads at a Harvard or at a Yale, in the church it's absolutely heartbreaking when you see the church move away from what she has been called to. As we'll see in our text this morning, this is nothing new. However, Paul says to the Thessalonian church, we can have hope amid apostasy. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? The apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote to the church at Thessalonica, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word even when it is difficult to hear and when it discusses difficult things like apostasy. Father, we ask you this morning to to be with us for your Holy Spirit, to teach us the truth of your word. Father, I pray this morning that the words that I speak are your words and, and not my own, that they are words that are filled with grace and, and with the power of the Spirit, so that we might hear them, that we might learn and gain knowledge from your word, but Father, not just for knowledge's sake, but to put it to practice in our life so that we can go out from here better stewards of the grace you have given to us through your son jesus christ and it's in his name that we pray amen amen thank you you may be seated when paul wrote to the church at thessalonica you have to understand they had existed for only a very short time at this point. If you go back to Acts 17, you can read the story of Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. You can see what happened there, and you can see from the text that Paul and Silas had only been in this city for three to four weeks. We don't know. We know that he was in the synagogue for three Sabbaths, but we don't know if it was four weeks, three weeks. It was, it was somewhere in between there before he had to leave town in the middle of the night because of the opposition to the gospel that was being raised in that city. Well, as a result, the Thessalonian church did not have the benefit of having the apostles teaching for a long period of time. The church at Ephesus, for instance, had Paul for three years as a pastor there. And then after Paul, they had Timothy. And then after Timothy, they had the Apostle John. That was a church, you can understand why when Jesus wrote to them in that first letter to the churches in Revelation, that they knew doctrine. They had it down pat. When you think of who their pastors were, it made sense, right? Well, the church at Thessalonica did not have that kind of background, and that's the reason why uh, Paul was, was so adamant about uh, uh, ascending Timothy to them. And then once he got the report back from Timothy, writing his first letter to them, and then his second letter, and all this happened within a very short period of time, probably about a year or two from the time he left Thessalonica till the time he wrote them. The apostle cared deeply about this church and about these people. He loved them so much, and he did not want them to be uh, led astray, essentially, by rumors of false teaching that would happen. Paul knew all too well, just as he told the, the elders at Ephesus, that after he left, wolves would, would come in and try to rip the flock apart. Paul knew this would happen as soon as he left any of the churches that he planted, and it was no different in Thessalonica. There were wolves who were looking to steal away the young sheep of this flock. Well, one of the ways that the rumors would spread in Thessalonica was through false talking. That's what Paul says here. On my office door, I have, a, I have a bunch of comics. And one of my favorites, I keep it up at the top. It's in a permanent spot on my door. It's got these three people sitting around on stools and in ancient clothing. And it says, Home Bible Study, A.D. 75. And, and one of those people is holding a scroll, right? And, and the caption underneath says, I think Paul wants us all to say what this verse means to us. Have you ever been in a Bible study like that? I have. What does this mean to you? Well, the problem with that is that we can get to talking about it. I can give you an example of how that can go horribly wrong very quickly. I was at a Bible study at a church one time on a Wednesday evening, and we were going through Philippians. What a great book, a book of joy, a book of challenge. Oh, it's good. But but the teacher's standard operating procedure was to essentially read a verse or two and say, what's that mean to you? Well, we got to that passage in Philippians 2 where Paul says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, now that's a difficult verse, okay? But it was being taken by itself, not in the context of the whole passage. And he said, what's that verse mean to you? And, and one older lady said, well, I think it means that, that Paul's telling us that we need to work for and earn our salvation. 
I was dumbfounded. I was sitting there, uh, uh, and I'm waiting for the teacher to gently correct her and, and bring her back to the truth of the, of the gospel, that it is not by works, but it is by faith alone. And, and the teacher just went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just about came out of my chair. Thankfully, there were a group of us who did, and we were able to correct that heresy right there, that other gospel that was being presented. See, that's the problem with that, is that Paul's not writing for you to have a personal interpretation. He's writing with the truth of God's word, inspired by his Holy Spirit. And we're to take that, but the problem is we have these false talkings, and, and we start talking about all these different things that we think. And what happens is we move away from sola scriptura, and we move into sola feels. That's what happens. We're, we're more worried about our feelings in all of this. That's why Paul describes false talking here as by a spirit or a spoken word. And in this case, he's, he's talking about that word by a spirit. It's, it's the word that means spirit in the Greek. And what it indicated was that somebody was speaking maybe a prophetic utterance in the church. They were being, they, they said, I'm speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit here. I'm prophesying. And Paul said, don't just take that at face value. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, he said, test all things, hold fast that which is true. So even if somebody comes and says, I'm speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit, okay, well, let's hear what you have to say. Because Paul also says, don't just dismiss them too quickly. Listen to what they have to say. But once you've heard it, go to the Word, take a look, and see if it matches Scripture. If it doesn't, don't accept it. Don't accept it. You see, we can't have this false talking going on because what's happening is there were some who had come into the church at Thessalonica and they were saying, hey, you know the day of the Lord? Remember Paul talked about that in his first letter to us? And he said that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night? He already has. It, he was such, so sneaky, he already came and went. And y'all were left behind. And that caused... Well, imagine if somebody came in here and said that. Hey, everybody, Jesus has already come and taken his people, and you're still here, so what's that make you? All right? Do you understand how that might cause some anxiety? Some concern in the heart of these young believers? These were young believers. These people had not known Christ for very long. So, so they were spreading these rumors there, and there were some who were struggling with the thought that they had been left behind. Well, let me give you a spoiler alert. They had not. All right? They weren't left behind. They were being faithful where they were. But it wasn't just false talking that the rumors were spreading. It was also through false teaching, either coming in the form of a letter written to the church uh, from, uh, from an apostle or in the form of a forged letter. Remember that when Paul wrote to this church in his first letter, he talked about the coming of Christ. And what seems to have happened is maybe some of these false teachers had taken the truth of what Paul had written and they twisted it a little bit. And they were teaching false doctrine to these people. You know, that happens today all the time. People take the existing word of God and they twist it and they teach false doctrine. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, John 10, 16. In that verse, Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Now, we understand that to mean that he's talking to his Jewish disciples about the Gentile church, about the Gentiles who are going to be brought in and grafted into the olive tree, right? But let me tell you what Joseph Smith did with that. And what the Mormon church did with that, they, they said, no, he wasn't talking about Gentiles. What Jesus was talking about was this secret lost tribe of Israel who 600 years before Jesus came, they had descended out of the house of Joseph. They had disappeared, but they all hopped in canoes and they paddled across the Mediterranean and across the Atlantic and they landed in the Americas and they established these huge civilizations that fought against each other, wiped each other out, and we have no archaeological evidence of any of that. 
all from, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. You see, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. That's what happened with these false teachers. But another strategy they may have employed was when they came in, they may have brought forged letters with them. We know that there were many forged letters that were being shared in the early church that, that people were trying to pass off. In, in uh, academia, we would call these the pseudepigrapha. That's your big word for today, pseudepigrapha. And all that means is false writing. All right, pseudepigrapha. You know, it's like the perpiscuity um, of Scripture. You know what that means, right? It means Scripture's clear. We use a big word, and, and sometimes theology can be that way. They, they have their purpose, and it's a good thing. But in the pseudepigrapha, what happens is somebody said, this is the gospel of Peter. Yeah, Peter. Peter's real important in the church, isn't he? He's one of the lead apostles. So I'll write this letter and say it's from Peter. And then everybody will read it and believe it. Or they may say it's the gospel of Thomas. Or the gospel of Judas, or the gospel of Mary, or the, you get where I'm going with this, right? There were a whole lot of these false writings that were going around the church, and, and they were using them to try to lead the sheep astray from the truth. Well, when you combine false talking and false teaching, it'll all lead to faulty thinking. That's what happens if it's left unchecked and untested. So Paul asked these brothers and sisters to refuse to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed by anything that these false teachers were proclaiming. Every time you hear about someone who claims to have figured out the secret to the timeline of Jesus' return, that's very popular today. That's almost a cottage industry in evangelicalism. We have folks who, who are figuring this out. They found a code, or they found a physical phenomena, or they, they know a harbinger, or whatever that may, case may be. And they're all saying, if you just follow this one thing... It'll tell you exactly when Jesus Christ is going to return. Just recently, we had another example of this. How many of you witnessed the solar eclipse that we had at the end of last year? That was a really neat experience, wasn't it? I can tell you in the days leading up to it, I was reading all kinds of stuff about people saying, the solar eclipse is coming and it's, uh, Jesus is coming with it. Let me, let me say this. You will have my attention if we have a solar eclipse and it isn't expected, all right? If all of a sudden we know because science, we know because of the rotation of the earth, the revolution around the sun, the orbit of the, the moon and the earth around the sun, we can predict when solar eclipses and lunar eclipses are going to happen and we can do it to the day, to the moment, to the second. We know this. If we have a full solar eclipse and nobody knew it was coming, that's a sign. All right, if we know it's coming, it's probably just a sign of God's orderly creation. That's why Paul says to reject these false teachings. But then, as we look at this and we consider what the Thessalonians were going through, is it any wonder that they needed some reassurance? Is it any wonder that they needed the apostle to write to them and to share with them a message that encouraged them and told them to stand fast in the midst of what they were hearing. You see, the enemy knows that he cannot steal God's sheep, but he can certainly lead them astray through false teaching and make them ineffective. He can fill their heads with all manners of false teaching and cause doubt and discouragement in their hearts. The reality is, and we don't like to hear this, but it is easy to be led astray. It can be very easy to be led astray, and, and especially when it comes to matters of the end times and matters of, of what we call eschatology. Let me share with you two reasons why that is. First of all, we who belong to Christ long for his return. If you're a believer this morning, you understand what, what John meant when he said in Revelation, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. We long for his return. We're waiting for the bridegroom to come and gather up his bride. That's why it's so beautiful. That imagery of the church as the bride is so beautiful because it expresses our longing and if we understand a little bit better the culture of Jewish weddings during the time of the writing of Scripture, it becomes even more apparent. You see, 
when a man and woman would become betrothed, it wasn't like today where people get engaged and they kind of sit down and start making plans and sending and say, put a date on the calendar. This is our wedding day. And they start sending out invitations and they register for gifts at Bed Bath and Beyond and everything like that, right? They're doing all these wonderful things. In this time, what would happen is in an arranged marriage, you'd have the man and the woman betrothed to one another and the woman would live with her parents and she wouldn't know when the date was of the, of the wedding. And the, 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 the bridegroom would go back to his family with his father. And they would start making the preparations for the wedding. They would start making the, they, well, first of all, we've got a new family, right? So we have to have a new residence. We have to build a new place for them. We need to prepare some rooms or a house for them. And then when everything is ready, the father would say to his son, okay, it's time to go get your bride. Does any of that sound familiar? If you've read the gospels, that sounds familiar because that's exactly what Jesus said it was going to be like. He said, the son doesn't know when he's going to return. Did that mean that Jesus, second person of the Trinity, fully God and fully man had no idea when the second coming was? No. He was using the example of weddings to demonstrate to the church that it, the time would come when the father said it was time to come. And when that time came, he would come and gather his bride and take her home. And it would be a wonderful, exciting, beautiful time. And so it is with us. We long for this, but sometimes that longing can become misdirected and it, it causes us to be misled about Christ's return. But on top of living, you know, and longing for Christ's return, we're also living in a world that's hostile to us. Listen, the world hates Jesus Christ. I'm not being hyperbolic there. The world hates Jesus Christ. And if the world hates Jesus Christ, the world hates people who are in Jesus Christ. And if you think I'm exaggerating, listen, Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. That's why John would write as he opened up his gospel, he said, Jesus is the true light who has come in and the darkness has not overcome him. The darkness is trying to overcome him. The darkness is trying to fight against him, but, he, but the darkness can't. Well, the darkness is going to fight against us too, because guess what? Once we are saved, once we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, we have his light in us. And that's why he can say to us, you are the light of the world. Not because of us, but because of who is in us. It's our light. And all those little points of light throughout this world of darkness... That darkness wants to come and overcome it. It wants to extinguish that light in us. And so as a result of this, we know in the midst of this spiritual battle that the only way there's going to be peace, the only way there's going to be an end to that kind of a battle is when the Prince of Peace returns and establishes his kingdom and consummates it permanently here on earth because we long for that, we can be a little too eager sometimes to see the events around us as being indications that Jesus' return is, is, is any, any second. See, the Bible says, be aware of the signs, be aware of what's going on, absolutely. But I think that the authors of Scripture would probably hold back a little bit from saying, you don't need to read the Bible and the newspaper side by side and look for signs in the newspaper to apply to the Bible. That's kind of getting it backwards. But that's sometimes what we do because we long for his return and, and we're tired, we're weary from the battle that we're in. So we sometimes read too much into current events and, and, and as we're studying scripture and as a result we're deceived and we're dejected. And the early Thessalonians seemed to have faced that same situation in light of the false teaching that some had said Jesus has already returned. And Paul's writing to offer them some reassurance. Let no one deceive you in any way. So how is it that we can avoid this kind of deception? Well, our best assurance comes from the established word of God. That is where our assurance lies. That's the only place that we can have assurance. Thank God that he has 
told us the story of redemption. Have you, have you noticed that, you know, the first words in Scripture are in the beginning? Right? So, so we've got it all the way back to then. And then we have the biggest story that has ever been told, the story of the redemptive history of God for his people through his son, Jesus Christ. And we move all the way through, and along the way we start getting pictures. And when we get to the end and we see Revelation, we've read the end of the book, we've read the end of history. And we found out Jesus is victorious. That's it. And if you're with Jesus, you're victorious as well. Jesus wins. If you're with Jesus, you win. We know the end of the book. It's the details that get us sidetracked sometimes. It's those little details about what's the seventh horn on the fifth head of the beast. It can get a little tricky, right? Okay. So we, we start hearing someone talk about the end times or we read a book and we get pretty excited about it. What we need to remember is that in all of these situations, scripture is our test. Scripture must be the measuring stick by which we gauge everything else. If it doesn't mesh with this, if it doesn't sound right, it may not be right. So go to the Word and check it out. Now, I know, I know many of you are faithfully doing this with the stuff that sounds off already. You already like, oh, yeah, that, that, that interpretation of John 10, 16 by the Mormons, yeah, that's okay. That sounds really off. I can go to the Word and see that that's really bad uh, exegesis. But I want to encourage you this morning that you need to do that with the things that sound right to what you already think you know. Because what can happen is a little bit of false teaching can creep in under the guise of something that is familiar to us. And we may see that and we may read it and say, yeah, okay, I see all that. Oh, wait, what's that? Oh, okay, that's just a little thing. Keep moving. Well, we've got to be careful. We've got to be sure that our theological blinders that we have uh, don't lead us to accept these subtle false teachings in certain things that we're already familiar with. And the reason, you see, our views must be conformed to Scripture, not the other way around. You see, the problem, though, is we often want to get Scripture to match what we already believe to be true. That's not the way that we're to approach the Word of God. Sometimes we already have our system, whether it's an eschatological system or a soteriological system or, or whatever that may be, and, and we think it's true, and then we hear something and go, well, but it's from a guy who believes what I already believe, so yeah, it's probably true. I'll take that. I'll run with it. And, and we find out that this is dangerous because it'll twist the Word to fit our pre-existing uh, conceptions. And we begin to live out that adage that says, I know what I believe and I'm not going to let the facts dissuade me. We have to be careful about having that kind of a prideful attitude. We must never get to that place where we think we've got it all figured out to the point of, of not listening to the word when it speaks to us. Now, I'm not suggesting that we cannot have a right understanding. I believe we can, and, and, and that's absolutely true. God didn't make the word so convoluted and, and ununderstandable that, that we can't know what it is that he says. But we all have to agree with the Apostle Peter when he says our brother Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. Uh, that's just the reality of it, right? And, and the beauty of this Christian life is as we continue to grow in our faith, as we continue to dig deeper into God's word, his spirit reveals more to us and gives us greater understanding. And it builds upon itself and we become more mature in the faith. That is where we are trying to move. But when we neglect our study of the doctrines that we think we already know it all about, we end up forgetting important aspects of those doctrines. And then on top of that, we rob ourselves of the riches of the depth of God's word as we go in there and get deeper and deeper. Now listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't read 
other books. I'm not saying that we shouldn't read other theologians and, and Christian writers. If you'll step into my office, you'll see that I have a very different opinion about that. I have hundreds and hundreds of books on my bookshelves, and I've read a lot of those. I'm, I'm trying to read all of them, and I have a lot more at home. No, it's okay, and other writings are beneficial, but they cannot be our basis. That's where the problem sometimes becomes. We like to read a certain Christian author, and then we make that the basis of what we believe rather than the Bible. And that can be a problem. Let me give you an example of this. Back in 1970, a very popular book was published. And some of you may have even read it. Some of you may even have it on your bookshelf. It was by Hal Lindsey. And it was called The Late Great Planet Earth. And some of you, oh, I see nodding, yep, yeah, okay, so you've, you've, you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, Lindsay, as he was looking at the world events, Israel had been formed. There were wars and rumors of wars. There were increasing famines. There was increasing natural disasters. It all seemed to be like the, the Olivet Discourse was happening right in front of us, Right? And then he wrote this book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And in that book, he indicated, he didn't come quite out and say it, but he was, he almost did, that the rapture was going to occur sometime in the 1980s. And the reason for that is because it was going to happen within one generation of the founding of the political state of Israel. And since that was 1948, and a generation was about 40 years, it had to happen by 1988. Well, 1988 came and went, and just like the Thessalonians, I, I, I hope this isn't a spoiler alert again for anybody, but uh, the rapture didn't happen. All right? It didn't happen. And then in that book, he also seemed to indicate that even the world would be done, that Christ would return, everything would be over by 2000. Well, it's 2018, and we're still here. And we're still going. Well, a lot of people really loved that book. I can remember when I was young, as a kid in the 80s, I remember that book getting passed around. When I was in youth group in the 90s, I can remember a lot of the adults talking about it. Absolutely, it was very, very popular. What had happened, though, is a lot of people made that book the basis of their understanding of the end times and not the Bible. And it led them astray. Now listen, I'm not, again, it is not wrong to read books by Christian authors on theological subjects. I encourage you to do so. But again, they cannot be our foundation. I love the way Spurgeon put it. He said, visit many books, but live in the Bible. That's where we need to be because it's through the sufficient word that we find all the assurance and the reassurance we need to avoid being shaken in mind and alarmed. It's, it's the assurance we have in the sufficient word that allows us to maintain a level head and a calm demeanor no matter what's happening in the world around us. And it's, it's the assurance we have in the inerrant word coupled with the Holy Spirit within us that allows us to have discernment about the things that are happening around us in comparison comparison and by the lens of God's word. And with that, we can discern apostasy and we can remain true and firm in the faith. The reality is we're going to need plenty of assurance, though, as we move steadily closer to the time when Jesus returns. That day when he comes, it is going to be a great and terrible day. And, and Paul says it's going to be a time of great rebellion against the Lord. Look again in verse 3 here with me. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Those words can be chilling, can't they? Jesus is not going to come until the great rebellion happens and when the man of lawlessness is revealed. But I want you to understand that Paul intended these words to be an encouragement to the Thessalonians. And it's an encouragement to us as well that we can look around and we can see all these things that are happening. And we can say, ah, the day of the Lord has not happened yet. Christ has not come back for his church yet. And, and I just didn't make the cut. That's the hope that we have here. He this, is, this is what had been being taught there. 
And to combat that false teaching there, Paul says that before Christ returns, two major events must happen. He says, first, there must be a great apostasy, and second, the Antichrist must be revealed. So let's look at the first sign, that, that great apostasy. That word that the ESV translates as rebellion, in the Greek, that is apostasia. Uh, apostasia. apostasia. And we get from that apostasy. It means a rebellion. It means a rebellion against the established order. Now, it could have a political implication, and in other Greek writing, extra-biblical Greek writing, that's exactly what it meant. But everywhere in the New Testament that it's used, it's used to refer to a rebellion against God and against his word. In fact, Paul's enemies in Acts 21.21 21 uses this word to accuse him of rebelling by rejecting the Torah, by rejecting God's word. They say, you forsake Moses. You rejected the Torah. You were apostasia. That's what he was saying. So the rebellion that Paul is describing here, it's talking about a massive rebellion of those who have professed Christ in the end times. He's talking about people who were part of what we would call the visible church. As we look around, we see the visible church. We see people in different churches and denominations and, and things like that. That's the visible church. Now, think for yourself for just a moment. Is everybody who is a member of the visible church really saved? No, they're not. There are many tares among the wheat. We know that. There are many goats among the sheep. We know that. Jesus said there on that day, there are many who will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. And I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we know that in the church, there also is what's called the invisible church. Those are the people who are saved, who are redeemed by Christ. But in the visible church... There's going to be a great falling away. There are going to be many who profess Christ and who rebel against God. That's what's going to happen. And this has happened at various points in church history. It, it, it didn't take very long after the apostolic age for some really pernicious heresies to start creeping into the church. One of them was this, that Jesus Christ was not fully God. That Jesus was the first created being. That's, that's what we call Arianism. That Jesus was not really fully divine. He became divine, but he wasn't always divine. He wasn't eternal. He was created. Another one that shows up pretty early is that uh, Jesus never possessed a true human body. It just looked like he had a human body. But really, he was spirit. Because if he had taken on a fleshly body, the flesh is evil. Jesus can't be evil, so he must not have had a fleshly body. Well, that's not what Scripture says at all, is it? Not even close. But that's what people tried to do. Well, that was Gnosticism. Because Gnosticism taught that all material existence was evil and that's why we had to get out of our material body and achieve a spiritual uh, uh, existence if you think by the 1500s the roman catholic church had developed a reliance on tradition and the magisterium of the church above scripture they had elevated those two things to be above scripture and as a result they taught that justification occurred as the result of faith plus works and not faith alone. And, and so you get to the 1800s and you see theological liberalism rise up and higher criticism uh, be launched in Germany. And all of a sudden there's all kinds of nonsense that comes out of the continent and comes over to America. And you have people like Rudolf Bultmann in the 1950s who say, we need to demythologize scripture. We need to take out all the supernatural Things that we see in scripture and just boil it down to the moral teachings and a little bit later by the 1980s you have the jesus seminar who did just that 
They voted with little beads on all the sayings of Christ to determine which ones he really said and which ones people added later. And you'll be uh, surprised to discover that all the hard things Jesus said, they all voted against. So you don't have to worry about anything about judgment or hell or anything like that. The Jesus Seminar took care of it for you. You know, we're seeing the continued result of that kind of apostasy today in our society. Look at the family. Look at marriage. Look at the church. Look at this rebellion against God's word. Look at what we've done to the unborn since 1973. If you don't think that being ripped from the anchor of God's word and from the faith doesn't have any consequences for a nation, just look around you. The evidence is everywhere. There are many who profess Christ in name, but in every way imaginable, they have rebelled against the truth of his word. And the great rebellion is going to incur in part, at least because of the mindless reception of these false teachings. Uh, when you see this, you understand why Paul was so adamant about warning the church about this. Now, I don't usually do this in a, in a message, but I'm going to put up a picture here in just a moment. How many of you have ever heard of or seen kudzu? A lot of you have. I'm, I'm from Georgia. Kudzu is the native plant. This is kudzu. Now, as you look at that picture, you'll see that, okay, you got a lot of vine growing there on the ground, but look at the trees in the background. Oh, no, there are trees there. It's just under the kudzu. Kudzu was brought into this nation as a way to control soil erosion. In the 1930s, the U.S. Soil Conservation Agency told people in the South, plant kudzu along the roadside. And that will help keep the soil from eroding. Now we have this. Because kudzu will grow about a foot a day. That's how fast it is. And once it's entrenched, it is incredibly hard to get rid of. In fact, the government has tried to develop herbicides to destroy kudzu. And those herbicides just made it grow faster. This is pernicious stuff. All right, it, it's tough. But kudzu gives us an idea of what false teaching is like. You see, it's just a little bit. Hey, plant this here. It'll help a little bit. It'll hold it back. And you go, oh, wow, that's really pretty. And kudzu's got beautiful flowers, and it smells nice. And, and they said you can even feed it to your cattle and your livestock, and, and, and it's going to be fantastic. And you go, okay, that sounds pretty good. And you let it in, and all of a sudden, before you know it, it is covered up and choked out everything that was living that's what happened. all those trees that are in the background there they're all dead because they get no light they get no soil they get no nutrition from the soil they get no water because the kudzu soaks it all up you see once false teaching has taken root in our lives we begin to doubt god's word it grows and 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 we may doubt wor doubt god's word about this one little area and then before you know it we're starting to ask questions about well uh, wow how how was jesus virgin born that doesn't make any sense now, how was he really 100 percent man and 100 percent god i know math that doesn't work how how is it that Jesus died in my place. How could he possibly have done that? You see, that's what happens. What's left is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel of man's making. So if you've ever wondered about why Paul is so adamant here, look at the kudzu. Consider that. And while there have been many apostasies in the church over history, the apostasy that Paul is talking about here in verse 3 will be larger than any other one that has ever happened. It is so big, it is so unique, that Paul even uses the definite article here. He says it's the rebellion. Not a rebellion, the rebellion. That's what's coming. But there's a second sign that he points that will accompany the great apostasy. It's the arrival of the Antichrist. 
And that's who Paul says is the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, or, or in the old King James, the son of perdition. Now, the word antichrist is actually only found in John's epistles. But when you read his description of the antichrist and you come to this passage here, you see they're talking about the same guy. They're talking about the same man here. He is the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. And Paul goes on in the verses after this that we'll examine next week to give us a, a better understanding of who the Antichrist is. And, and we'll see that next week. So, so we'll just kind of pause there and just say, look, we're talking about the same person. This man of lawlessness is the Antichrist. But what's important for us to distinguish this morning is the difference between the Antichrist Antichrist, who's the man of lawlessness here, and other Antichrists with a little a. There's Antichrist with a capital A, Antichrist with a lowercase a. And there's a difference. There's a difference. Over history, there have been many who have had the spirit of Antichrist. Think of the Roman emperors. Think of Nero who impaled Christians on stakes and lit them on fire in order to light the roadways in Rome. He was, anti, he was an antichrist. Think of Domitian or Decius, who had uh, empire-wide persecutions of the church, trying to destroy it. They were an antichrist. A little bit later in church history, Muhammad comes onto the scene, and Muhammad says... I am higher than Jesus. He's an antichrist. Lowercase a, but he's an antichrist. Get to the Middle Ages, and we start seeing several popes who can have this same designation. The corruption, the, the debauchery, the, the horrible things that they did, they too were called antichrists. Napoleon, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler... Mussolini, Hirohito, Mao Zedong, Kim Jong-un, the Ayatollah, all antichrists, all of them, but none of them, as awful and horrific as they are, are the man of lawlessness that Paul is describing here. I want that just to sink in for just a moment. The worst one I can think of in that, and we can, we can have a debate over whether it's Stalin or Hitler, both are equally reprehensible. And as terrible as they are and as responsible for as many deaths as they were, neither one of them were the man of lawlessness. They were not the Antichrist. They were not the son of destruction, which is a term, incidentally, that Jesus uses to describe Judas Iscariot in John 17. So that tells you just what kind of a person this is. These sound like terrible events, don't they? False teaching is going to flood the church. A great falling away is going to occur. A terrible figure is going to arrive on the scene unlike anything anybody has ever seen in the history of the world. And as we'll see, he'll demand worship even from God's people. And he'll leverage false teaching in order to get great swaths of the church to fall away. People who had professed Christ and they, they gave it all up to worship him. This false teaching will be so powerful that Jesus says even the elect might be deceived if it were possible. But praise God, that's not possible. If you are a true believer, you will not be deceived here. And that's why Paul's writing this. He's, he's writing to give them hope amid this apostasy. Hope. Listen, God gives sustaining faith to his people so that they may persevere to the end. That's who God is. He's going to complete the work in you that he began at your salvation. He has promised that. Praise God that we don't have to be be worried about whether or not Jesus came and left us behind. We have a great hope amid all of this. And so as we close this morning, let me share with you just three quick reasons how we can have hope amid the apostasy that's coming. First of all, all of this is known to God. He's already told you about it. He knows it's coming. He knows. This is not a surprise. God is not in heaven wringing his hands going, oh, no, what are those people doing now? 
oh man, this is, this is terrible. I, and he's, he's not up there wondering how it's all going to turn out. He's already told us how it's all going to turn out. He already knows it. Not only does he know it, guess what? This is all part of his plan. Now that may be hard to understand. Why would God allow these terrible things to happen? Why would there be such a great apostasy? Why would he allow this man of lawlessness to come and, and do so many horrible things? This is part of his plan, and it's designed to show his mercy, his grace to those who he redeems. It's here to show us who he is, that he is the sovereign God of the universe. He is the loving God. He is the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and me on the cross. And he raised him from again on the third day, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father now, and he's coming again in power and glory. All of that is his plan, and it's his plan so that he may be glorified in all of it. And one of the ways he's going to be glorified is that all of God's people are going to be saved. Every single one of them. Every single member of God's redeemed people are going to persevere to the end and he is going to save them. There is not going to be a single sheep that is left behind. There's not going to be a single sheep who is lost because the good shepherd will not allow that to happen. Praise God. And so this morning, if you're worried about what you're seeing going around in this world, have hope. Because Jesus is coming back. And Jesus is going to set it all right. And he is going to bring with him judgment against those who have rebelled against him and who are his enemies. He's promised that. He's promised it. But those of you who have Christ in you, this is a great day. It's the day we long for because it's the day he's coming back to gather up his bride and to take her home. Oh, boy. So this morning as we close, the, the praise team's going to come in just a moment. They're gonna, we're going to sing one last song. I'm going to be standing right down here. And if you're here this morning and you, you don't know Christ... You're, you're not like my young brother, Aiden, who has placed his faith in Christ alone for his salvation. If that's not you, if you're trusting in your works to get you through on that last day, if you think there's going to be some kind of scales that your good is going to outweigh your bad, come down and talk to me. I'd like to introduce you to Jesus. And I'd like to tell you about what salvation through faith only means and how you can have that this morning. God says, today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your hearts against it. So come this morning. If, if you just need some hope, if you need a word of encouragement this morning, come down here. Let me, let me pray with you. Let me lift you up before the throne of grace. We'll go boldly there, and, and we will receive from our loving Father grace sufficient for what you're facing right now. It's available to you. I encourage you to come as we sing our last song. But let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word that you have given us today. Father, thank you for the beauty of your plan. We fully recognize that we don't understand all of it. And there are parts of it that are hard for us to understand, or, and sometimes parts that are hard for us to even accept. But Father, help us to, to train our hearts to approach your word and not judge you by some kind of external rule of justice but father let us understand that if you do it it is just by nature whatever it is father we ask you this morning to renew our hope in christ's return we ask you to give us who are your people that hope to go out here and even in the midst of, of escalating tensions internationally and threats of, of incoming missiles and, and, and the holocaust against the unborn that we are seeing in this nation. Father, give us the hope that we need to know that you're coming to correct it. But Father, give us the hope that we can go out and stand firm in the battle, proclaiming the truth of your word to this world and knowing that your word does not return void, that it will accomplish everything that you intend for it to accomplish. And Father, we ask you this morning that if there is anyone here who doesn't know you as their savior, 
that today would be the day of their salvation and that we might celebrate just as we did at the beginning of this worship service over that lost one who was found, that sheep who has been brought into the fold. And we'll celebrate with all of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.